the most dramatic division I ever attended from No Outspan by the Nace Reitz. General Herzog, in the course of his lengthy speech to the cabinet, had indicated that on Monday, the 4th of September, he was going to move a resolution in Parliament declaring South Africa to be neutral in the war. He was such an autocrat by nature that I verily believed he had never paused to consider whether he could carry his motion through the House. In the past, his method had been to walk into our caucus and lay down the law with a slap of his fist on the table. He brooked no opposition, and at any hint of criticism, he would threaten to resign and appeal to the country. This generally sufficed to bring his own immediate followers to heel, and on our side, members had more or less let him have his way for the reason I have already indicated. They had accepted General Smuts's advice not to precipitate a break on minor differences. I am convinced that he thought he could walk into Parliament in the same way on the Monday morning and force his neutrality motion on us by sheer domination of his personal prestige. Relying on this ascendancy, he had never troubled to count heads, and he had no idea how members were likely to vote on a fundamental issue such as this. Had he done so, an interesting but not reassuring problem would have faced him. The South African House of Assembly consisted of 153 members of Parliament, of whom all but six were now in Cape Town. Of those present, 147 in all, 144 belonged to the United Party, 29 were nationalists, forming the official opposition under Dr. Milan, a doer old Calvinist, seven were Dominion Knights, the British equivalent of Milan's Afrikaner extremists under Colonel Stallard, a Tory of the mid-Victorian school, four were Labour members, and three were so-called native representatives. On paper, therefore, General Herzog had a large majority against all comers, but his snag was that, of the 104 United Party members serving under him, 66 were supporters of General Smuts, and he could only rely on a personal following of 38, a fact he had never seemed to realize during the six years of his reign. On the other hand, the 29 nationalists, all violently anti-British, would vote for anything anti-British, and they would support a neutrality motion. With his own tale of 38, and with the 29 nationalist recalcitrants, he commanded 67 votes against our 66. But we knew that the seven Dominion Knights, the four Labour members, and the three native representatives were with us, giving us a majority of 13. We had made a preliminary canvas, and we were sure of our ground, but General Herzog, in his blind arrogance, thought that he had a majority in the House, and that he could carry his neutrality motion. Indeed, he had told both the Governor-General and General Smutso, and now he had blundered into a pit of his own undoing. That evening, General Smuts and I, and the five cabinet ministers who had supported us at Khrutaskir, had met in the Civil Service Club in Cape Town and drafted a counter-resolution, which General Smuts was to move the next day. By the Monday morning, Dame Rumour had been busy. The House was to open at 10.30, but from 9 o'clock onwards, members were thronging the lobby, and we were eagerly questioned. Was it true that the Cabinet had broken up? Was it true that General Herzog was to introduce a neutrality motion? 
What right had we to decide without consulting the party? And so on and so on. They were understandably indignant, for General Herzog should at any rate have consulted his wing of the party. But that was his affair, and we left him to explain things to his own people, while we hastily ranged for battle. The speaker droned the stereotyped prayer, and the bill to extend the life of the Senate was passed. Now came the real business before us. The public galleries were crowded, and there was breathless silence when General Herzog rose to put his motion for neutrality. He spoke for a long time, and he repeated the arguments he had used on us at Grotteskir. Hitler was justified. The British connection would always drag us into wars, and we in South Africa should remain out of the conflict. Then General Smuts put his counter-resolution. He briefly stated our case for participation in the war. A long debate followed, which lasted until nine o'clock that evening, and then the bells rang for the most dramatic division I have ever attended. The tellers took a long time to check their lists, but we did not need them to inform us that we had won the day. I watched General Herzog where he sat across the floor of the house. His face was ashen, and it seemed to me that only now had it dawned on him that he was staring at defeat. The other five cabinet ministers who had voted with him looked angry and perturbed, and I gained the impression that they were furious at the way their leader had bungled himself into an impasse. But it was too late. The tellers completed the tally of the votes and handed the lists to the speaker. He stood up to announce the result. Eyes in favour of the Honourable, the Prime Minister's neutrality motion, 67. Noes in favour of the motion to enter the war, 80. The noes have it. We had won by a majority of 13. It is possible that General Herzog might have secured a small majority had it not been for his blundering tactics in eulogizing Hitler, and had it not been for the forceful and powerful speech by General Smuts in reply, which brought round many waverers. The decision was quietly received, for during the count we had sent a whispered message to our side. Men, don't rub it in. Let there be no gloating. We felt that it was too grave a crisis for noisy demonstrations, and now all the members filed out, most of them deep in thought, for the full significance of what had taken place had scarcely come home to them as yet. Firstly, it meant that we were at war with Germany, and that we might soon be at war with the Italians. It meant, too, that General Herzog was beaten and that he would be obliged to hand over the government of the country to General Smuts. Only that morning, General Herzog had called on the Governor-General, Sir Patrick Duncan, to tell him that he was introducing a neutrality motion, and that he had a majority for it in the House. Now, a few hours later, he went to Government House to resign his office, after having been Prime Minister of the Union for 15 years. With all his faults, we were sorry for him, but we rejoiced that General Smuts was at the head of affairs once more, and that South Africa would have his wisdom to guide us, instead of being at the whim of a man who, though possessed of great qualities, was too obstinate and too erratic and illogical to be relied on in times like these. The Governor-General immediately called upon General Smuts to form a new cabinet. From the voting in the House it was clear that we held a majority only by the grace of the Dominionites, the Labour members, and the native representatives, all of whom had sunk their party differences in the common cause. General Smuts, therefore, decided to create a national government.